The first song I think I heard that actually made me want to listen to other bits of music was in a Persian marketplace by Sammy Davis Jr. And I got a feeling that because the version I heard in those early years, I could only have been 12 or 12 and a half, maybe 13, and it was this in a Persian market, don't, 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 go down, da 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 I came face to face. So I've got a feeling it, it had the beginnings of a kind of rock and roll feel, even though I couldn't describe it at that at that age. But that's when I first heard it, and it made me really interested. And then, of course, when Elvis came later, two or three years later, that really boomed and changed my life, actually. It did make me feel really good, actually, because the music of the time, and, and Sammy Davis is of the period of Frank Sinatra and Bing Crosby and all those people, and yet somehow or another he was not like Frank Sinatra, not like the other guys. He did seem to be kind of rougher, and, and, and I think it must have appealed to me. It had to have appealed to me because I, I actually saved up money, and actually it's the first record I ever bought. It wasn't Elvis. It was He was the first record that I played at home. My mother used to like writing the lyrics down of all the songs she liked, and she had a real tricky way of doing it. In a Persian marketplace, she'd get to... She's listening to her, she'd go, in a per... Then the next time she goes, Jean plays. And she, every time she heard it, she added to the lyrics. And in the end, she had a great volume of, of lyrics. But it made me feel good. And it, it, it's the first record I heard that made me want to move to it. I didn't know how to move. I was only 12. But it made me happy and made me want to dance. Since my baby left me, I found a new place to dwell. It's down at the end of the only street at Heartbreak Hotel. After Sammy Davis um, and his song in a Persian marketplace, it wasn't long after that that I heard Elvis. And I think I think the reason, I mean, Elvis was actually so different. When you think that people of my age were born when the change was coming, one minute we were listening to Sammy Davis, Frank Sinatra, Bing Crosby, and it seemed like the next day, it was Elvis Presley, Little Richard, Buddy Holly, the Everly Brothers. But th- that song, Mark, the Inner Persian Marketplace, I, as far as I can remember, is the first time that I actually really went quite crazy about it. I wanted to hear it again. And it was played on the BBC at that time. So for me, it, it obviously was influential, but I can't get over the fact that once I heard Elvis, that's when I wanted to be what Elvis was. That's when I and my two friends who heard the Elvis, we heard that Elvis song together, not knowing who it was or what it was, that we all said, this is it. Oh my God, what, did, what was that we heard? And it's the one song, Heartbreak Hotel by Elvis, that made me want to do that. I decided that's what I want to do, if I can do it. At that age, at 15 or 16, there's no way I could have said to you, I knew I was going to be a pop star. No. I just didn't know, but I wanted to be. My friends and I, there were three of us that we were the original drifters. Me, um, I I wasn't Cliff Richard then, so we were just, I just created a name. Uh, Terry Terry, uh, Smart was the drummer. Norman Mithen played guitar and I played guitar. So really we didn't have a bass or piano. We just strummed and drummed. And we, we played at school, you know, and things like that, the end of term party. And at that stage, I'd heard Elvis. We three had heard Elvis. The car that came down our... We were in a town called Waltham Cross in Hertfordshire. And we used to go down to see what was going on in town. And suddenly this big green, I think it was, the the French car came like that. It it looked like it was something out of space. And um, the windows were down. The engine was running, and the guy jumped out and went into the local... It, it was a shop called Asplans. I think it sold cigarettes and newspapers. I don't know what he went to buy, but the window was open. Now, we were looking at the car, Citroën. We're thinking, oh, wouldn't it be great? We're going to own one of those cars one day. And and suddenly we heard, Since my baby left, boom, boom, I found a new place to dwell. And the guy came back in, shut the door, and drove off. We didn't know who it was. And two days later, Norman, uh, some, we didn't have phones, we didn't have cars, we certainly couldn't have cars, and he, he came around and said, I know who it was. And he said, I've been listening to the American Forces Network from Germany, and he said, it's a song called Heartbreak Hotel, 
And it's been sung by a guy called Elvis Presley. And at first, of course, we fell on the floor with laughter. We said, Elvis, who got a name like Elvis? Now we know. <laughs> and of course, that, that made everything. It, it changed everything because that's when I, at a, as a 16-year-old, I guess, or 15-year-old, thought to myself, oh, I, I want to do this. This is what I want to do. And had I not seen Elvis, and I've said this many times, if there was no Elvis, there'd be no Cliff Richard. Well, the first time I heard it was because I bought the first album of Elvis, which was just that, but the 12-inch albums. So those of you who are under the age of about 40 probably don't remember that we used to have an album that big, which means that on the f sleeves you could see more than just the face of the artist. The album was just called Elvis Presley in pink and green. And in fact, on many of my albums early on in my career, I used to use the same font and color as a tribute to Elvis. But the album, I think it started with Blue Suede Shoes. And I, I thought, what a great song. I thought, okay, this is an Elvis song. It was not long after that that I read that Carl Perkins had had the first hit with it. He didn't make number one, Elvis did, but he, I think he got to number two. And, and Carl Perkins, I'd, I'd never heard of him, but when I thought of that, then I did see him at one point, I don't, not live, but I saw pictures of him, and he was a he was very a uh, humble man. He said the only reason why he couldn't be as big as Elvis is big. He said because I'm married, got children, and I look like a horse. I think he was overdoing it, but he but he didn't get make it as big as Elvis. He did go back and continue to sing though. But Blue Suede Shoes, for me, is an Elvis song. But now I can honestly say that I'm happy that I learned that Elvis was singing other people's songs. But Carl Perkins has to be credited. That song has now become the classic, along with a lot of Elvis stuff, it's as classic as All Shook Up, as Jailhouse Rock. Fantastic. Carl Perkins must go down in history in that era of wonderful rock and roll singers and writers. Now, Lucille, you know, it's one of the craziest things. What, the songs and the artists that were coming to us were absolutely alien to us, I think so. In the same way as I thought that car, that Citroen, looked as though it had come from space, you couldn't believe that someone like Little Richard, who could scream and shout and, and be as fabulous an artist as he was. Little Richard, Jerry Lee Lewis, these guys were crazy. They they never stopped moving on stage. It was absolutely fantastic. Still being at school and still pretty young, and it was prior to me hearing Elvis Presley, maybe a year before, Suddenly, this thing exploded. One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock, and it was Bill Haley and the Comets. I mean, it was crazy. I must have been only 14, I'm sure of it. That, And so even, even when we stayed behind at school, they sometimes had a little, they let us stay and we could play records. And I remember dancing to Rock Around the Clock. And it's the one, my sister, my, uh, I had three sisters, and the eldest of the three, Donna, she and I would work out and we'd watch on, the, we'd see her something on the television somewhere where, where the guy flings the girl under, the, picks her up like that. I could do that, and I did that. And we was, it was just the most fun music. It's funny that he didn't survive that long as an artist, and it's a shame because that album was full of fantastic rock songs. So Bill Haley is definitely part of the influences. It's always the same. It's something hits, hits you that you like, and it's not true for everybody. I mean, some people may not have liked Bill Haley, but certainly in my school, Everybody loved him. We, th we thought he was fantastic. And in fact, when he came to England, um, there were, he, came up, he arrived in a train and there were thousands of people waiting on the platform to say hi to him. And we decided, a group of us in, in school said, we've got to go and see him because he was appearing in a, in a cinema quite near to Chessant. 
in Edmonton. So we decided when the ticket went on sale, we four or five of us decided to skip school that morning, got up really early. By six o'clock, we were waiting in a queue and the queue was already round the theater. So we stood there, we got our tickets. And then it was so late, we said, let's just go home. So we all went back. I can't remember whether they came to my house or somebody else's, but we just got, didn't go to school. And somebody snitched on us. And I, who was a pre prefect at the time, um, lost my badge because I had skipped school. And my English teacher, she said to me, Harry, what a stupid thing to do. You won't even remember Bill Haley in 10 years. I tell you now, 10 years later, I knocked on her door, it was her birthday, and I said, hi, and I gave her a bunch of flowers and said, Bill Haley. So I did remember him and can still remember him. And he's part of that era that this generation of people that you may or may not have seen because of our age, we go, I mean, I go a long way back now, but it's it all came with, for, for these, in, it's not such a, I was going to say a few artists, it was loads of fantastic artists that came from America. And Bill Haley was definitely one of them. So I walk away to flat to that boat, about six cents out of here, I'm going to climb rail of the great well, a big big boat around the back to say, well, I reached to the top, but I'm too tired to run. Eddie Cochran came along, and I think the first time I heard him was in... Um, the Girl Can't Help It. There was a movie called The Girl Can't Help It. And um, he was one of the acts in it. Gene Vincent was in it. And certainly he was. And he sang that, you know, one, the 20 Flight Rock. It, it, again, when you see him, uh, I saw an image of him on, where he did, I think, a big TV show in America. And he had an Elvis look about him. And yet it wasn't Elvis. You knew it wasn't. But he had that thing. And he had this big, he'd move his legs around and yet still be able to sing. I found it later in life that the danger is with moving and dancing and singing around is that you don't have enough breath to be able to sing the song. So whenever I used to use a choreographer, I'd say to him, look, I'll do the dance in the, in the instrumental, but I can't dance all the time. I need to sing live. And so we got away with it that way. But Eddie Cochran was able to just do it, and, and, and he was fantastic. And 20 Flight Rock must be amongst... If, if not the top 10, a certain top 20 of the rock and roll songs that influenced many of us, if not all of us, who sing rock and roll now. I bet you, you wouldn't find anybody at my age or even 60 or 50 years old who started singing rock and roll. didn't If they didn't know that song, if they didn't know about him, there's something wrong with them. <laughs> you shake my nerves and you rattle my brain. Great Balls of Fire, by that stage, um, the, the BBC were playing songs at that stage, you know, rock and roll, because the BBC used to play the Fratinatras and things. And even when I started, my, I heard my record in between Ella Fitzgerald and Frank Sinatra, which is really weird because they're the sort of jazzy people, the big stars of the time, but they were just letting us break into things. And so I'm almost certain that I would have heard it on one of the shows that the BBC had running out at that stage. And, uh, you know, Jerry Lee Lewis, Great Balls of Fire, was, uh, again, I saw him as an amateur but having, it was just fantastic to see him on stage. He would leap and jump. He'd jump on the piano. He could play the piano with one hand and still sing. His uncle played the guitar. He was, and for me, still is, regardless of anybody's death, they still are in the memory of people who love rock and roll. I'm never going to forget them. Because if you've got your memories of the people you love, they're always with you. And it's the same with rock and roll. It's just, just there. I'll never forget Elvis. I'll never forget the Everly Brothers. And never forget Jerry Lee Lewis. It's, it's just part of the being of a rock and roll singer. Shape, 
Yeah, Move It was one of those accidents, really. Uh, we, we had decided that uh, that we would go and play at the Two Eyes Coffee Bar. Well, we didn't decide. In fact, our acting manager, John Fa- Foster, had gone down there and met the guy that was managing the... Uh, it was a coffee bar with a sort of club underneath it, and people came and played, and, and they offered us five quid to play for the whole week, and the three of us went down. And somewhere during that week, this guy came up. He was in the uh, Royal Four Air Force, I think, and, and he had his... He didn't have an, uh, a uniform on, but he told us what he was do- what he was doing, and he had a guitar. He said, "Can I sit in with you?" And we said, "Okay," and he came and played kind of a lead guitar, and we said, "Do you want to join us?" And he said, "Yes." Now Ian Samwell was that guy, and he wrote "Move It" on the way to be uh, to come and have a re- rehearsal at my house in Chessent in Hertfordshire, and on the way to come to the rehearsal, he wrote Move It. He wrote the first verse and the, and the chorusy thing. And he said, it's not finished. So we said, play it. And he just played. He didn't play the intro. He just went, come on, pretty baby, let's move it and groove it. Of course, uh, it, it, we said, ah, fantastic. We were so excited that that... Here we are, like the Americans, creating a new song, and it sounded like good rock and roll. Anyway, that's what we played when we were finally introduced to Norrie Paramore some months later. And we plugged, we had one simple amplifier. It had two points where you could plug your guitars in. So we plugged our guitars in, and we played Move It. And uh, Norrie said, done. See you in the studio. We'll record that. I'll find another song for the A side. And he found one called, uh, what was it? I forgot. I'll think of it in a minute. But um, we went in to do Move It. And we said, but it's not finished. He said, oh, don't worry about that. You do the first verse. You do the chorus. We put a guitar solo in there. You do the first verse and the chorus again. And that's how the original Move It came out. And it did get to number two in the British charts. We just got beaten by Connie Francis. And uh, so she stopped me having my first ever number one. But it, it didn't stop me. It, it meant that I could, it was possible for us to be in the top five. And, and Move It was written by somebody on a bus. And it doesn't make sense to me sometimes, but because he couldn't have had his guitar out on the bus. I wouldn't have thought so. He'd have just going, come on, pretty baby, let's move it and a groove. And it, it, and it made it for me. It was fantastic. And, and when you think... Um, the press sometimes say to me, you know, how, how does it feel? You're not really cool, are you? I always say, John Lennon thought I was cool. John Lennon, I quote him, said, before Cliff and Move It, there was nothing worth listening to in Britain. Thank you, Jen. God bless you. So somehow or another, we got a song that was really good. And even even the then John Lennon, who hadn't become the Beatles yet, had seen it and thought it was a really great record. So I, I, again, I, there's a great deal of luck that comes our way. I've been told many times, even by the press and some public, some people that I've met say, oh, you did get lucky, good for you. I said, well, you know, most people have luck come to them. What we do, whether you're an actor, a dancer, a singer, you have to grab luck by the throat. If it doesn't work, you can throw it out. And I think most of the people I've spoken to, yes, there's been that element of luck. How did I meet them? How did I get invited to do this? We grab it. I grabbed it and decided I'm going to give my life to this. And again, the luck for me is that I did succeed, but I still grab it. I'm still competitive. I still want to record. If I could record every single day in the studio, I would. But what's the point? It's no point. You can't put an album out with 365 songs on it. The, suddenly in the charts, the, you know, you, you hear the, here they are, the Kalin twins, and then you hear, when, when you smile, when you smile at me, oh no, another song I wish I got first. Anyway, we all loved it. It was number one for, I don't know, five weeks. And here's where it went wrong for them, uh, and right for the shadows of myself, is that we had been invited to, uh, I was given the chance to be on a tour 
where the Kalen twins would be the headliners. And there was, there was me, there was the Mickey Most, the Most Brothers. There were other five or six artists on the show. And we were set to play just before the Kalen twins came on. Now, we were really thrilled because here is another American singers singing a massive big hit, and we were going to be with them. What we didn't know is that already because of Oh Boy, my image had grown quite a lot in Britain, nowhere else at that stage. And so every night when we went on, I mean, I, I felt bad, I still feel bad about it, but I've already met them again and apologized. But we finished our little 20 minute set, The Shadows and I, and the crowds would be shouting and screaming. And then the compare would come on and say, now, Caitlin Twins. But they didn't get a chance. They didn't, they didn't get a chance to come on immediately because the fans were still going, "We want Cliff, we want Cliff," and this went on and on and on. And in the end, their manager came to me and said, "Look, um, I hate to ask you this, but do you might, could we move you down into say the first half of the show?" And you know, people have always thought that I'm just a goody two shoes and that I have no strength. But way back then, I realized now. I said, "No." because I recognized that we were doing something that you'd never have expected. And it, it was tough on them, but the Shadows and I decided to stay where we were. And so the Kalen twins didn't have a very good tour. And way years later, when I was celebrating our 50th anniversary, I thought, this is my chance. And I got in touch with the Kalen twins. I said, we're doing a huge, great show at Wembley, the Empire, the, not the Empire, the, the football pitch. And uh, I wrote to them and said, would you come on and be with us? They happily said yes. And they, they came on and I did. I apologized to them. I said, I'm so sorry. I remember those days and I feel I was really nasty. They said, don't worry, we'd have done the same if it was you in the top. <laughs> so they were absolutely perfect about it. And it was nice to get in touch with them again. And the interesting thing is they sang when... And I could see the crowd all singing when with them. Because, so, you know, it's, it's a long time ago, but my audience tends to be an, an adult audience, and they all knew it. So I was so glad I invented them because in the end they got a chance to sing and had the reaction that I'd had when I sang before them. So it was a really good time, and, and un unfortunately they didn't, they didn't really make much more. It was really a one-hit wonder. And that's that's a sad thing for artists, but they've got on with life, they've got married, had children and things, and therefore are still successful people. If you knew Peggy Sue, then you know why I feel blue without Peggy. But Peggy said, oh, yeah. yeah, all this stuff was just pouring over us, and suddenly we heard this thing that went. In fact, that was the second one. But the first one was That'll Be The Day by Buddy Holly. That'll be the day when you come along. And again, we it, it was the kind of fact that there were two guitars, drums and bass and a singer. And we thought, this is kind of like us. We, we're pretty empty. But it wasn't empty. And they, Buddy Holly played great guitar. And I'm sure he put his rhythm guitar on first and then put on the solos that he used to play. And it was a fantastic track. And then, of course, it led to Peggy Sue. Can you imagine if you knew Peggy Sue? It blew us all away. And, and again, Buddy, like Ricky, died in a plane crash. It's just un unbelievable that uh, quite a number of artists have, have died. And mostly because in Buddy's case, they were doing a show and the whole, there was a whole bunch of artists there and they wanted to get to the next place quickly and it was at night, a night flight and there'd been a storm and we lost them. And it's called, they, didn't they write a song called The Day the Music Died? Big Bopper was on the, on the same plane and uh, uh, not Marty Robbins, although Marty Robbins also, I think, died in a plane crash. But anyway, that happened and it's, it's one of those things that we can't forget but what we definitely can't forget is the music that Buddy Holly gave us. It, there was a musical about him. I mean, the musical was two hours long. His career was 18 months. Everything he wrote was all in that short period of time, which goes to show how much rock and roll can enter your soul and you can let it pour out by writing things. <laughs> If your heart is 
suddenly Clyde McFatter's name came up, you know, but before I'd ever heard of him, we'd called ourselves the Drifters. And um, once our career got going, we realized that the Drifters had been going 10 years before us in America. So for us, it was, we just changed our names. I think between Hank and Jet Harris, they decided on shadows. I think Jet said, we've always been in the shadow of Cliff. Let's be the shadows. And I thought, fabulous. But um, in 1960, we, I was invited. We were still the Drifters then. Uh, the biggest show of stars for 1960, and they spelt my name wrong, the Drifters and Cliff Richards. <laughs> so, and on the, on the bill was Clyde McFadden, who was the lead singer, one of the lead singers of the Drifters. And I'd heard, we had heard him before that the, the treasure of love. The treasure of love is easy to find, it's not very far. It was just, again, songs either get you or they don't, you know. You have to forgive me, I'm just giving these songs that, that I have loved and that have been hits by other people, so obviously many people like them. And to me, going on that tour, and to find the Drifters and I are uh, amongst the people whose records we had at home, who we loved as singers. Clyde McFatter was on there. Bobby Rydell was on the show. It was fantastic. It was full of big names. And we, we thought, <laughs> we're in heaven. When marimba rhythm starts to play Dance with me, make me sway like a lazy ocean hugs the shore Hold me close and sway me more like Yeah, Bobby Rydell was really interesting. If you see pictures of him, he didn't really look like a rocker, but he could sing. And uh, he had a couple of big hits in Britain. And there was one, you know, when, when something rhythm starts to play, dance with me. Make me sway, and the record was called Sway. And uh, he used to go out night after night and s sing these. He had a couple of hits before that, but every single night he stopped the show. As I say, three of us did, but he was one of them, and uh, absolutely magnificent. When he somehow stopped being a pop singer, or maybe he still sang the pop stuff, but he, I believe, was a great drummer. He, I know he was a great drummer. And so he'd play Vegas. And of course, people in the audience used to love the fact that he could sing. And then he'd get back on the drums and go. <laughs> so uh, he had something that I didn't have at all. But uh, very, very good performer as well. You don't get, you can't stop the show unless you've done something that really appeals to the public. And so every single night, we just, we watched from the side. The Shadows and I watched every act from the side of the stage every day for about six weeks. And uh, it was just fascinating to see how Bobby Rydell worked. It was really, really good. Uh, I don't think he played drums, though, not on that. He just sang, because I think we all had about 20 minutes each. So it's, at, at the most, it would be like five songs each. And he'd had two or three hits. So um, it was, he was a, a really, really great guy. Very nice man, too. From what I remember, it was easy to talk to these Americans. I thought they were going to say, oh, you Brits, you don't know how to do it. But obviously they thought we could. So we were accepted into the team that became the biggest show of stars of 1960. Because you're my funny valentine. Sweet comic valentine. I never thought I'd ever go back to jazz because when I listened to jazz music on the radio before rock and roll started, it, it, it didn't get to me at all. It seemed a bit complicated. And suddenly there was rock and roll and it wasn't complicated. But I was in, introduced by somebody saying, you must listen to this record, it's Dakota Staten. I thought, great name. And then I played it and she's a jazz artist. And she, uh, she sang brilliantly. And I'm, I went to see her at a, a jazz club in London, and she sang a song called My Funny Valentine. But she had this fantastic My Funny Valentine. And, and it was, I couldn't believe it. And I used to use, not just her, but Peggy Lee as well, a b bunch of artists like Morgana King, all female artists, and sometimes at night when I couldn't sleep, I used to have one of those little turntable things. You put your needle on the record. I'd fall asleep halfway through, and all, all because Dakota Staten was singing or Peggy Lee was singing to me. 
and it was good. And I still feel that the artists, even if I wasn't a great jazz fan, you can learn that, that in some cases you don't have to bellow your lyrics, that you can actually hold back and sing, I've had many times, I can tell you. I learned it all from some other people. And I'm sure they would say the same. They learned from other people. And it was great. Dakota Stanton was a terrific artist. I'm not sure if she's still alive, but I hope she is. Although I haven't heard recordings of us for ages. But the other, I, I don't think Morgana King is alive. She was the one that was singing at the front of that big um, Godfather film. When it starts, there's a big Italian party going on, and she's the singer. And that was Morgana King. And she had like a four octave range really pre-Whitney and people like that. And it was fantastic to listen to these kind of artists that had nothing to do with rock and roll. And yet, they became a little bit part of me. Whether I liked it or, not, or wanted it or not, I couldn't help it. Can you imagine going through life? How would you be if you had nothing to influence you? Hello? You'd be the one person on the planet and you'd be boring. <laughs> time to convince Nori Paramore, who, was, who produced Move It, Move It and a couple, first two or three of my records, three or four of my records, um, it took me a while to influence him and say, look, The Shadows, and he said, look, I can't take the gamble, it's expensive to record, and, and they're an amateur group. I said, yeah, but you got, he said, bring them in, I'll listen to them. They came in. He said, okay, that's it. They're your band and we'll record with them. So I had done that and they became the shadows and we worked together on my music. And then um, they got by Jerry Lorden, a writer who then sent a demo in and it was Apache, an instrumental. And the shadows, of course, was thinking they could do this as a single. Norrie was a little bit worried about it because of what a promoter had said. He said, it's almost impossible to get an instrumental into the charts. So we all took a deep breath, and this guy said to Nori and to me, what about if Cliff plays something on the record? I can then go out to the radio station, and Cliff Richard is, is, is playing instru an instrument on this record. It wasn't a guitar. I would have been a, they found a thing called an Indian drum. It may have been a Chinese drum, I don't know, but it's a funny shape. And what I did was play the intro. Uh, the intro went... Hank went... By the time the four bars had gone, my, my, my drum had been faded out and the shadows were there. And they did get to number one. I'd like to think I helped by, by doing that little bit of in the beginning of the record, but they did get to number one. Um, and it's interesting, I've asked people, I said, do you know who they knocked off number one? Because well, number ones are always getting knocked off and they don't know. And I have to gr gr grind my teeth and say, it was me they knocked off. After all I did for them, they knocked me off the number one spot. I had a Bruce Welsh song, Bruce and, Shad Bruce and Shadows wrote a song called Please Don't Tease, and that was number one, and they knocked me off. And when I, when I think back on it, I said, I didn't, f you know, it's really strange. Because we were so close, we were like a family, we toured, we lived together in hotels and things. I just felt so proud of the fact that here we are, me, and them in the charts. We heard Love Me Do almost immediately it came out. I mean, it was being played everywhere, even though I think it got into the 20, maybe maybe low in the 10, 10, 10 or 9 or 8 or something like that. But the Shadows and I, we both said, oh, I wish we'd got that one first. You know, as, as artists, you tend to listen to other people and think, oh, why didn't we get that song first? Because we felt that we could have done it. And it was, it was one of those Love, Love Me Do. And the thing is, we were about to embark on a tour of South Africa way before we got banned from going because of apartheid. And so um, 
I said to myself, I'm going to take this record with me because whenever I went and did radio stations in South Africa, they'd always at some point say, okay, we want to play what you want. And sometimes I'd go, oh, anything by Elvis. I couldn't pick a song. So I took Love Me Do with me. And when they said, can we play you a song? Here it is. I said, play this. We had a little CD. And they would play it, and we'd talk about the Beatles. And I said, oh, well, they're never going to make it. And they said, well, why not? I said, well, they got a name that sounds like something you tread on, a Beatle. <laughs> How wrong could I be? <laughs> it, was, it was unbelievable what happened to them after that, though. I never thought of them as solo artists, actually. And, of course, it was a surprise and great when they did get solo. John made great records. George Harrison, My Sweet Lord. Paul McCartney, once he founded the, the new band. and I mean, they were fantastic records. Uh, but as the Beatles, to me, um, I can understand, for instance, that it, with the Shadows, most people were more interested in, in Hank as the guitarist of the Shadows. I don't think they were more interested in me as a singer of the Shadows, but I was the singer. But in the Beatles, they, they did it all together. You know, they, they, were, they were a bond. They all played everything. And so, therefore, it's hard to pick one. If you were asking me to say... Who do you think was the, the best singer in the band? I, I would put Paul as probably the best voice, the highest voice. John was lower but forceful. Uh, George would sing everywhere. Uh, of course, Ringo didn't sing, I don't think. So it's hard to pick out one. But if I was to say, if, if they say, of the Beatles, who would you like to have sounded like most? I would say Paul. Not that I could have sounded like him, but if you asked me if I could choose of the three, I would choose Paul. Oh, oh, oh. 